When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, Yeah. 
It's about the cross, it's about my sin, it's about how Jesus came to be born once so that we could be born again. It's about the stone that was rolled away so that you and I could have real life someday. It's about the Sleep, holy child. 
Bibles this morning to Galatians chapter number four. Galatians chapter number four. And if you will turn over to Luke chapter number one, we're going to start in Galatians and then go to the book of Luke. Of course, many of you are familiar with the book of Luke being known as the Christmas story. I want to read a text this morning in Galatians and then go back just a few moments. I'm glad that Jesus died for me. Amen. Very thankful. Very thankful that somehow, some way, that the Lord looked at us with love while we were yet sinners, understanding our hopeless and helpless situation. I couldn't imagine my life without Christ. I know how much we struggle being saved, how much the world brings against us being saved, how much that we see being saved. In other words, being part of the family of God. We endure these things. And by the way, thank the Lord because that's how we can experience His power. I thank God for that. But I could not imagine my life without knowing the Lord Jesus Christ as a personal Savior. I just don't know. I don't know how I would find hope. I don't know how I could give hope. I don't know how I could ever tell anybody it's ever going to be all right. And it's not just a Christmas story. That's a Day to day, a week to week, a month to month, year to year, never changes. The only way that we ever have hope is found through Christ and Christ alone. As I look back over this year, I think of the folks that have battled sickness and health and problems and different things. I've seen people that have battled cancer and got bad news from about a mom or a dad or a loved one, someone that the Lord has chosen to take home. And you see the hearts break. And you sit there with absolutely no words to be able to encourage them. The only thing that you could say is that Christ is still the answer. That when you lift Him up, that He can give and do exactly what needs to be done. And I'm not saying that uh, to be able to prep the sermon. I'm saying that and testifying. I'm glad today that I can look back in this year and last year and every year and say that my Lord and Savior has been faithful. And it ain't just been about church, it's not been about religion. I am praise the Lord, it's been about a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And because of Christ, I got a relationship with God the Father, amen. 
Look at in Galatians chapter number 4. I want to read four, three verses. Starting in verse number 4. The Bible says this, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son. The Bible says, Made of a woman, un, made under the law. To redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive an adoption of sons. Verse number 6, very specific. And because ye are sons, God had sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Now, I'm interested in this because you notice in the latter part of verse number 6, the word Father comes. We think about God, and we think about God being, forgive me for just kind of being teaching for a minute, we think about God for a moment thinking about the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. Many times at Christmas we stop and we say, thank the Lord for God the Father, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. If it was not for the Father giving His Son, we would not have Christmas, thus we would not have salvation. I'm thankful today that I'm saved, I'm thankful that I know that I'm going to heaven, but that's because God, as the Bible says, that He's not willing that any should perish. If you're thankful for that this morning, say amen. We talk about Jesus. For God sent not a son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. That means Jesus was the sacrifice. He wasn't sent here to be able to live a life of perfection, to be able to humiliate you and me. That was not the goal nor the purpose of Jesus Christ. So what was it? It was that the Lord would be able to be used to be able to be the answer, the substitute for our sins. For God hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So I thank the Lord for Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen right there? Listen, if it was not for God the Father and God the Son, we'd have no hope. But what about the Holy Ghost? We forget about the Holy Ghost. We forget about it. We think about these things. We think about what is the Christmas spirit. Many people say, do you have the Christmas spirit? Well, I finally got the spirit of Christmas. I'm ready to go. And, but I would dare say to you, be very careful because to be able to have the spirit of Christmas, listen, it's only found in a person and not an event. And it is Christ and Christ alone. So what is the Christmas spirit? Who is the Christmas spirit? What is the spirit of Christmas? It's the Holy Ghost. A lot of people today you ask them what is the spirit of Christmas they're going to say it's giving well I, I feel this the spirit of Christmas whenever I begin to give they they say I begin to spill feel the spirit of Christmas when I begin to wrap presents begin to do some things I I begin to think about it when I turn on the music I can start feeling like it's Christmas time when I put up the tree and the lights and all those things and by the way I'm not knocking that by any means but I'm trying to give you a practical truth today to hear me well, it's going to last you when Christmas is over. When all the hoopla and all the fancy is taken down and everybody begins to pack up all the ornaments and all the lights and the Christmas tree is put away and now all the happy-go-lucky family is not so happy-go-lucky and January, February, March and April and May all throughout the year begins to come and pressures begin to settle in and you wonder, why is it not the way it is at Christmas time? It's because so many times we fail to think that the spirit of Christmas is all these events and all of these things and all of these lights and all of these presents. And here's what happens. The enemy begins to rob us of our joy. Because what we realize is or what we don't realize is that we make what Christmas is all about about the wrong thing. Sometimes people find the spirit of Christmas in a bottle. Christmas comes around and they begin to be able to find themselves and they figure out, well, I can't make it. I got to face my family. They don't want to talk about it. They're going to face their friends. They will have a social gathering, if you will. But the only way to be comfortable is in a bottle. It's not the Christmas spirit. We're drowning sorrows. You say, I'm saved. I don't have a life of sorrow. You might not. But you can be saved and not filled with the Spirit. When you're not filled with the Spirit, you're going to be filled with something else. That's what the Bible says in Ephesians 5 in context, that you be filled with the Spirit. Not to be drunk, not, 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 not to be able to do the things of this world, but when you're filled with the Spirit, you can overcome your trials. There is no such thing in your life that you will ever face that will ever come against you 
that will ever be done to you that you cannot overcome with Christ and Christ alone. But you do it man's way, you'll fail. You do it the bottle way, you fail. You can snort all you want to snort, and you can socialize all you want to socialize. But the only hope and satisfaction and peace and the rest at night when nobody's watching is going to come by one way and one way alone. And again, it's a person. It's the Holy Ghost. You say, well, I, I look at my life and I'm just trying to work up the Christmas spirit. You don't work up the spirit. The spirit comes down. It's the Holy Spirit. You say, well, I, I'm just trying to be able to get it. The spirit's not in me. We come to the, the, the holiday of Thanksgiving and this is what people say. Well, I'm not putting up the Christmas tree. Uh, the, the spirit is, is not in me right now. I'm just not there. Now, all the spirits, it should never be in you. It's found in Christ is where the spirit's found. Sometimes we say, well, I'm not really in the feeling of Christmas right now. And I want to say to you by reminding you again that Christmas is not an emotion and it's not an event. It's not a Christmas morning at 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 12, 1, 2 o'clock. Whatever time you gather with your family. That's not what Christmas is about. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm not preaching to you today to discredit the way you and I celebrate the birth of Christ. And I'm not preaching today for you and I to examine it and be able to think, well, bless God, we're heathens or we're wicked because we have these traditions. Nothing's wrong with that. I'm trying to tell you to some, something today based upon the authority of the Word of God that I don't care who told you something. I don't care what somebody else said. I don't care what a preacher, what a Christian. I don't care what a mom or dad, a sibling, a son, a daughter, a memo, a papa, a papa, a mama, what anybody has ever said to you. The only thing that Christmas is all about. It is the Lord Jesus Himself. And let me tell you why I'm telling you that. Not to discredit what we do. Because I want you to know that there's another 364 days of the year where you need the power of God. You need the strength of God. You need the help of God. You need another reason to get back up and believe that no matter what mountain you're facing or what valley you're walking through, no matter how dark your life or your family's life might be, you can and you will and you shall overcome whatever you face as long as you keep the main thing the main thing and that is the Lord Jesus Christ in your life the Holy Ghost lives inside of you the Holy Ghost lives inside of you and there is no such excuse to ever say well that's just the way I feel and be right because if you yield yourself to the Holy Ghost even when it seems to be wrong God will do what God wants to do. I want to look at Luke chapter number 1 and 2 this morning. I'll tell you why. Because there's evidence there, the Holy Ghost, all throughout the Scripture. To be able to reveal to us simply what it is to be able to have the Christmas spirit. To be able to think about the Holy Ghost. To be able to understand the Christmas spirit. To be able to know that the Holy Ghost is real. It's not something that's scary. Are you understanding? Sometimes we, we think about the Holy Ghost. We're scared to be able to talk about that because it's a ghost. We, we think about the movie Scrooge or the play Scrooge or a Christmas Carol. And we think that the Christmas spirit is, is the past, the present, and the future of a ghost that comes and tells Scrooge. That's not what it is. We're talking about the Holy Ghost. Do you understand that? Completely different from what this world illustrates. And I want to say... I really just kind of go on record, I love the Lord and I love the Holy Ghost. You want to know why? Because when Jesus died, He gave His life. He left behind a comforter known as the Holy Ghost. He lives inside of me. And listen, though Jesus ain't standing here physically holding my hand, and though God the Father is not looking and talking to me like my earthly father is, He left part of the Trinity, all three of them being the same with a different personality. Are you understand what I'm trying to tell you? In other words, they're all the same but with a different purpose and a different a personality and a different function. And the Holy Ghost lives inside of me. So though I don't have Jesus today telling me how to make this, this next decision, the Holy Ghost living inside of me can help me make this next decision. Though I don't have Jesus or my, uh, my Heavenly Father telling me how to be able to choose to be able to do the right thing when I feel so overwhelmed or, or beat down 
down or abused or mistreated. I can't listen to the wisdom sometimes. It seems like, how do you discern it? It's because the Holy Ghost lives inside of you. It is crucial today that we yield to the Spirit of God. It is crucial that we understand that the Holy Ghost matters. And we got to remain filled with Him. Are you understanding that? we got to be empty of ourselves. we got to be denying ourselves and understanding that if it was not for Christ, that Christ alone, we'd have no hope. But I love the Holy Ghost. You want to know why? He was the first person that told me about Jesus. He said, no, it wasn't. It was my mom. It was my dad. It was my preacher. No, friend. They might have got up there talking about it, but it was the Holy Ghost that was touching your heart. It was the Holy Ghost that was saying it's you. He got there preaching on John 3, 16, and all of a sudden you heard that word. And that word fell on your ears like anything else you ever heard. But there was something that touched your heart. It got deeper than your ears. It got deeper than your skin. It got deeper than what you could see. And it was a tug at your heart. It was the Holy Ghost that was telling you about Jesus Christ. There was a mom or a dad that prayed over you and you thought it was their prayers. You said there's something about them that's different. No, it might have been their words that was going up at night and they might have been serious and they might have been sincere. But it was the Holy Ghost that came to where you was as you overheard mom and daddy or me, mom and papa praying for you. And it was the Holy Ghost that said, I want you to know that Jesus died for you. He was the first one that told you about Jesus. I'm also thankful for the Holy Ghost because he's the one that still teaches me about Jesus. Listen, I love church, I love reading books, I love preachers, I love listening to people that study the Word of God and teach the Word of God and do it well. But can I tell you, no matter how well you are in your speech, and no matter how good you are illustrating something and teaching something and explaining something, can I tell you, you might be the instrument that God used, but it's the Holy Ghost that reveals something that's so deep as the Word of God. Are you understanding that? That is deep. This is not shallow. This book is not shallow. This is deep. You know, as well as I do, there's some things that you and I try to overcome. It's just too big for us to be able to understand. How do you overcome it? It's the Holy Ghost that touches your heart. So I want you to look in this text and be able to see some things. The first thing I would say to you is having a Christmas spirit is connected to incarnation. What do you mean by that, Brother Jason? Notice, if you will, what the Bible says in verse 34 and 35 of chapter number 1 in the book of Luke. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing... I know not a man, Mary, never known a man, never had a child, asked this question. Verse 35, it comes back, and the angel answered and said in her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the high shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. What are you saying? It is connected to the incarnation. In other words, it's where Jesus came, where he became man, but he never ceased to be God. Are you understanding what I'm trying to tell you? It's at a place to where literally that the Lord had come, and here Jesus is now uh, going to be coming in, but he never sacrificed who he was. He never changed who he was. He, he became the Son of Man, but yet he also became to be the Son of God. And by the way, Jesus didn't start in Bethlehem. The Holy Ghost didn't start at, at, at Pentecost. That's not what it started. If you go back to Genesis chapter number 1, verse number 2, the Bible says that, that literally the voice of God, that He began to speak and He turned and He changed it. He began to speak things in existence. And what God is teaching us is this. It's from the beginning of time. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost, they've always existed. And just like it was in the middle of creation, do you understand this earth was nothing? It was all void. It was dark. It was empty without purpose. But yet when the Lord, when the Holy Ghost began to move, things change. You know what that tells me? I wasn't here when God created the earth. But Brother Jacob, I still got some situations in my life that seems to be chaotic. It seems to be clustered. It seems to be unorganized. But when the Holy Ghost begins to work, the same thing that he did in Genesis 1-2 is the same thing he can do in 2019. I want you to notice what I'm trying to get to in verse number 35, if you will. The Bible says this word, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee. It said, and the power of the highest shall, notice this word, overshadow thee. Overshadow thee. I want to ask you a question. Who overshadows who in your life? Do you overshadow the Holy Ghost? Or does the Holy Ghost overshadow you? 
Somebody, listen, somebody goes to Mary. Can you get the picture for a moment? Mary, you've never been with a man. You never know the man. Mary, you have never been married. And you're going to tell me, listen, friend, you're getting ready to have a child. You're telling me you're getting ready to have a baby. How does something like this happen? How does God bring life from something that does not even seem to exist? How can God help me in my situation where it seems to be lifeless with nothing, but yet something alive and powerful and real can come through? I'll tell you what happens. We do the same thing that Mary done. We yield ourselves, and instead of us overshadowing the Holy Ghost, we submit ourselves, and we allow the Holy Ghost to overshadow us. Let me tell you something, sir, ma'am, child, teen, elder, whoever you may be, if it matters to you. You want Christ to be seen in your home, in your life, in your ministry? Yield to the Holy Ghost and let the Holy Ghost overshadow you. You say, it just don't seem to make sense. I don't understand it. I can't see the change in my children. I can't see the change in my home and my ministry and my life. I, I really don't understand. Why does it seem like I keep running against the wall and I just can't not get nowhere? Maybe it's because we're so busy overshadowing the Holy Ghost, doing what we think, what we feel, what we deserve, never seeing the Lord do what only the Lord could do. And the reason is, is because when we step in the way of the Holy Ghost, we hinder what the Lord's trying to do. And I want to I wanna tell you, this Christmas, holiday season, however you want to say it, and not just at the end of this season, but for the remainder of the year, if it matters to you, because I will stop for a moment and go on record and say it matters to me, I wish I could tell you that the devil only fought me one day a year. I wish I could tell you that the devil only fights you one week of the year. I wish I could tell you that there's only one day or one month out of 12 months or even six months that the devil's going to fight my church family. I wish I could stand and tell you that, hey, as long as we make it in those six months, everything's going to be all right. I wish I could tell you that. But you listen to me. That's not the way it works. That's not the way it works. And there's going to be times when you get blindsided in your life with choices and decisions that you have to make. And it seems like you're overwhelmed and you're so confused and it seems like it's chaotic and you don't know to trust the right or the left or go forward or go back or stand still. You can't listen. Sometimes you can't hear. You say, how? How do I see Christ in this? How do I see God in this? And you're reminded of Luke chapter 1 where the Bible says that the only way for us to be able to see what Mary's seen is for us to be overshadowed by the Holy Ghost. The second thing that I would say to you about the Christmas spirit is not only that it's connected to the incarnation, but I want you to notice in verse 41, go down with me in Luke chapter number 1. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled, notice this, with the Holy Ghost. And she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is thy fruit of thy womb. And whence is this, come, this to me? And the mother of my Lord should come to me. For lo, as soon as the voice of the, thy salutation sounded in mine ears, the babe leaped. In my womb for joy. Not only do you see that it's connected to the incarnation, but you also see that it's seen in preparation. Mary's at a place to where she is now walking a hill. She gives you a backdrop. She's going to Elizabeth, who is pregnant with child, and we understand that literally that Elizabeth is pregnant with John the Baptist. He's the forerunner of Christ. He's the one to be able to say, come see a man, to be able to see a man, to be able to point to the Lord Jesus Christ. That was the purpose of, Christ, uh, of John the Baptist. He was the one to be able to do this work. What was John the Baptist? What was his work? His work was to be able to point others to Jesus. And I, I often think how many of us really point others to Jesus. He said, I want my life to have some purpose. I want my life to have some meaning. I want my life to be more than a job and a paycheck. And forgive me, I don't downplay our family. But listen, I, 
When I go to heaven, I don't want to stand before God and say I was a daddy or I was a husband or I, I done this or I done that. Listen, I, I want to be what the Lord wants me to be and I know that's your heart's desire. Does people see Jesus in you? Did you notice what the Bible said? That literally that when it came to this place that in verse 44 that leaped in a womb for joy. How do you have joy? Anybody longing for joy? Do you feel like your joy has been sucked out of you? I've been there. I've said that many times. We blamed it on so many things. We blame it on activities. We blame it on our family. Here comes Christmas. We're going to sit around the Christmas table. It's family Christmas. And you know Uncle so-and-so and, and Aunt so-and-so and, 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 and Brother so-and-so. Watch out for them. They're one fry short of a Happy Meal. You ever been there before? We think, how do I have joy? How do I have joy when my heart is broke? How do I have joy when I know what nobody else knows about me? How do I have joy? How do I move on when it seems to be unmovable? How? I want my joy. I want to feel joy. I don't want to be made up in a church and a religion. I definitely don't want to be made up in a, I don't want to be made up in my money and I don't want to be made up in my house and my cars. But yet that's what we blame. We blame everything for the robbing of our joy. When the truth be told, according to the Scripture, it was the Holy Ghost. Being filled with the Holy Ghost. Did you see that? The Bible says, being filled with the Holy Ghost. When Jesus now, when they begin to come and they begin to meet, that leaps in the womb for joy. You want your joy back? Yield yourself to the Holy Ghost and be you filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. I want to ask you, are you filled? Are you filled? The Bible says that there was joy. There was joy that was there. Y'all stay with me. We'll move forward. The spirit of Christmas. Not only is it connected to the incarnation. Not only is it seen in Luke chapter number 1. In preparation. But you also see in Luke chapter number 1 is connected to exhortation. See, the first one was Mary. The second one, we came to Elizabeth. But now John the Baptist in the third one, I want you to notice in verse number 67. Follow along with me, if you will. And his father, Zacharias, was filled. Uh-oh, here we go again with the Holy Ghost. Now, I ain't even got through this yet, but can you see a pattern? Man, it's so easy to blame everything. It's so easy to brush off everything on something else or somebody else. It's so easy to say that we dread Christmas and holidays. We dread life because of this. We dread that problem. We dread that encounter. And friend, can I just be real with you? There's a lot of things that I dread. There's a lot of things that, forgive me, that I don't look forward to. There's a lot of valleys that I would not choose for myself, Brother Vance. Brother Gary, there's a lot of a wilderness is I would walk through. There's a lot of things that I wouldn't choose. There's a lot of things that I wouldn't choose. When you come to this text, it says I'm being filled. Sometimes we don't realize that when things happen, and it's not what we choose, that the only way to be able to see Jesus is to be able to yield to the Holy Ghost so God can do what God wants to do. It's the only way. You say, life's not fair. I've said it many times. If we got what was fair, we'd all be in hell. Amen, preacher. I don't care if you're over here in the corner or all the way over here in the corner. There ain't not one of us, not near one of y'all that would be going to heaven if you and I got what we deserve. And I don't care if your sin is a fifth of liquor stumbling all over it. I don't care if it's murder, if it's rape, if it's bitterness, if it's wrath. I don't care if it's a, if it's a sin of the Spirit. I don't, I don't care what your sin is known, openly not. If every one of us got what we deserve, we would be going straight to hell. Amen. But, but the Lord... He died and he rose on the third day. And when he left, friend, he didn't leave. He lives inside of me. 
So he comes here to the man by the name of Zacharias. And it says in verse number 67, he was filled, and listen, and prophesied, saying, let me give you some understanding. This is Elizabeth's husband. Stay with me. Before this, he did not believe that his son was going to be the son that he was told to have. So you know what God did? God shut his mouth. God began to chasten him and begin to correct him. And if you want to say it this way, he closed him in. You want to know why? Because he didn't believe. Listen to me. You know what I've learned and I'm learning? When we choose not to believe the Lord, that's when life seems to close in on us. When I refuse to believe that God can, that's where it gets tight. When I refuse to believe that God will, that's where I've been. I begin to be silent. I can't find the words to be able to say I'm speechless. And I find myself not knowing what to do, what to say. And the walls of life close in. And it seems like you and I are pressing so hard to be able to get everything taken care of. But the harder we press, the more it closes. You want to know why? Because we don't believe. But the moment he believed, the Bible says in verse number, listen, 67, he was filled with the what? He was filled with the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. And at that moment, at that moment he began to prophesy, that tells me that God can do what God wants to do, but we're going to have to choose to believe him and not only believe him, but behave the way we believe. What do you believe? Well, it ain't from your truth and it ain't your perspective. Preach on, preacher, preach on. We have to believe the truth of the Word of God. You say, Brother Jason, I sure would like to have joy. I sure would like to be able to know. I sure would like to be able to speak. I sure would like to have an opportunity to be able to see God and Christ in my situation. How do I overcome it? How do I make it? How do I do it? By letting Christ be lifted up because you're filled with the Holy Ghost. But you notice here that he began to speak. I want to ask you this question and I'll move to my last point. When's the last time that you spoke of the Lord? When's the last time that instead of your problems and your situation and your life and your preference and your dreams and your say-sos, that you did not talk about those, but you talked about the Lord? When's the last time? I know we all have place. There's many of you that are shy. There's many of you that might say that I don't really feel comfortable talking about all those things or talking about the Lord. I understand. Some of you are comfortable, and I understand that as well. You say, well, I, I, it's not that I'm shy. It's not that I'm, I, I'm not comfortable. Sometimes you just say that I, I'm not outgoing. I, I really don't know how to approach somebody. I don't know what to do. I feel intimidated. Maybe it's this way. I have fear. I have fear of being denied. Sometimes that's the truth. But you know what I've learned about serving the Lord and speaking about the Lord? It's not about personality. It's about spirituality. Hello, look up here. It ain't about how good you are. And it ain't about what you and I know. It ain't how good you are speaking to people. You understand that? It's about spirituality. Listen, when you're filled with the Holy Ghost, friend, you can't help but get it out. You can't help but tell somebody. You can't help but open up your heart. You can't help but do those things. Why? Because you want the Lord to be seen in your life. And a lot of times, instead of using this to lift up the Lord, we use this to hurt the cause of Christ. But yet we want the spirit of Christmas. Lastly, and I'm done, I get somebody to come to the piano. Turn over to chapter number two, if you will. talking about the spirit of Christmas and I want to remind you I'm not talking about just the spirit of Christmas that's done in a season. Hello friend. I'm talking about you and me living a life of joy. Listen to me. A life of purpose. A life of contentment. A life of seeing Christ 12 months a year 365 days a year 7 days a week. Are you understanding this is not a holiday message? 
This is real life. This is real situations. This is real things that we must understand that it's a Bible principle that we must apply to be filled with the Spirit. And the best way to celebrate Christmas is not presents and gifts and lights and trees and poinsettias and red suits and red ties and red dresses and green and all this and that and your Sunday best. And I love that. Nothing wrong with it. It would do my heart no more joy. As feeble as my mind is and as shallow as I may be when it comes to comparison to God than to be able to see you have a true joy simply because you make up your mind that though I don't understand everything, I'm going to trust the Lord and I'm going to be filled with the Spirit. You be filled with the Spirit, it'll change our lives. So it comes to my last point, to have the Christmas Spirit, it's going to be seen and connected to consolation. Consolation. See, when we open up Luke chapter number 1, we see that he was in the incarnation. When we go on down in Luke chapter number 1, we see that he was in preparation. When we go a little bit further in Luke chapter number 1, we're able to be able to see that he was in the exhortation. Look up here, I'm done. But the last thing you see is he's the Lord of consolation. It is seen in consolation. Notice what the Bible says in verses 25 of Luke chapter number 2. The Bible says this, it says, And behold, there is a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. The same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost, ghost again, there it is, was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost. How did it reveal to him? So let, let, let's get this straight. In verse 25, the Holy Ghost was on him. He was filled. In verse 26, the Holy Ghost revealed. Did you see that? You're looking for an answer. You know where you're going to get it. With God. Go to verse number 27. Don't stop there. Notice. And he came by the Spirit into the temple. Wait a minute. So not only is he in him, is he on him in verse 25. In verse number 26, you notice that he reveals what he needs to see. But now in verse number 27, this is where it gets personal to me. The Holy Ghost guides him. You know what? We're sitting in a group of people right now. And I understand. You can begin to play. We're sitting in a group of people right now. There's a lot of mixed emotions. There's some of us that are saved. We know we're saved. We understand what salvation is. It's not just the fall of Jesus. It, it's not just about God. It's not just about the death, burial, and the resurrection. That's not what it's about. We truly, without a doubt in our mind, in our hearts, we know that we've come to a place of repentance. We've asked Christ to come in our hearts and save us. Ask God to forgive us. Understanding that there was no hope without Jesus being a substitute. We know we're saved. And then there's some people that's sitting here this morning. Listen to me, friend. This is eternity we're talking about. They don't know. And the devil might have them gripped by the throat. They're scared to death to admit it. Because maybe they made a profession somewhere. But as they sit here and they search their hearts, they don't know. Then there's people here that's saved. Boy, Christmas comes and you do get excited. You love the family. You love the Lord. You love Christmas. You love, you love the season. You love to give. And by the way, none of those things are wrong when you're doing it because of the purpose of Christ. You understand that? None of that's wrong. But then there's some of us that that's not the feeling. That feeling is empty. There's some of us that's sitting here that Christmas brings different emotions. You think about the times that you had without. You think about a mom or a dad or a loved one that God has recently taken home. There's a difference in you now because of things that you have faced. And though everybody else is excited and kids are ready to be able to open up the presents for Jesus' birthday, there's just something inside of you that's just not at ease you're trying to get help and then there's some that it ain't because of something that's just done 
you really just feel empty. And I want to tell you just as empty as I could say of myself, but as bold as the Holy Ghost will say it to you, that if you will just submit yourself this morning, and ask the Lord to fill you up, no matter what you're praying about, no matter what you're seeking, no matter what you're trying to overcome, no matter if you're sitting there and you're doubting salvation, I'm telling you, if you ask the Lord to make it plain, I can testify the Holy Ghost done a good job revealing to me that I was lost and on my way to hell, but He still loved me and Jesus died for me. You can trust the Lord this morning. And I've sat in services where I knew I was saved. But the same grip of Satan seemed to be around my throat, around my mind. Maybe it wasn't personal. Maybe it was because of you. And I knew you had a battle. Maybe it was me. And the same thing I said to you a while ago is the same thing I say now. You have to yield to the Holy Ghost. It's the only way you and I is going to overcome it. It comes to this place Simeon was struggling he was old. He was dealing with things and there seemed to be no hope. Where does hope come from? Look up here. As desperate as I can say this. Submit to the Holy Ghost. Let's be honest. You and I go to church a lot of times looking for an answer. Let's, I mean, don't we? Don't we just say, Lord, speak to me today? We'll turn on the radio. We'll get up in the morning and say, Lord, will you speak to me today? We open up our Bible and say, God, I need something today. We're looking for an answer to be able to guide our children, our home, our family, our wife, our son, our daughter. We're trying to find strength to be able to get up and keep on going. And we're looking for it. When the simple thing is this, we have to yield to the Holy Ghost. Do you understand it today that some of you are sitting here and you're thinking, if I could just get the courage. Look up here. It ain't about you getting the courage. It's about you yielding to the Holy Ghost. Would you hear me, please? It's not about you manufacturing it. It's not about you fixing it. It's not about you controlling it. It's not about you having it your way or what you think is the right way. It's not about that. It's about yielding to the Holy Ghost. And when you yield to the Holy Ghost, God will fix a marriage. When you yield to a Holy Ghost, God will fix a home. When you yield to a Holy Ghost, God will save that son or that daughter. Save that wife or that husband. God will save them. When you yield to the Holy Ghost, you'll learn to be still and trust the Lord as He deals with the heart of that wayward child. You deal with the Holy Ghost. You yield with the Holy Ghost. Look here. That's where you come up to the sea. You realize there's no break. And then all of a sudden, by submitting and being still where the Lord sent you, all of a sudden He parts the waters and you walk through on dry ground. Everybody all right this morning? So the invitation this morning. I want to ask how many of us sitting in this sanctuary have already said I need a true Christmas spirit not a spirit that lasts me a holiday but a spirit that I yield to year round there might be somebody you love that you've been praying for that's struggling there might be a need and you're looking for the answers and, maybe, look, and look, look up here maybe you're not at the bottom because I've learned until you get to the bottom, usually we choose to do it our way. But when you get there, when you get there, I wish I could tell you I'll be there. I wish I could tell you your friends will be there. I wish I could stand to tell you the church will be there for you. I can't, but I can tell you who will be there. And it's the Lord. You'll trust Him. Heavenly Father, I thank You. 